right, we're going to be talking about Burns uh, finishing up his presentation. So each year there's lots of people that get affected by burns. There's about 120, 25 burn centers in the United States, and they see about 200 admissions uh, every year. Uh, the highest incidence of burns occur in the first few years of life and then between oh, about the ages of 20 and 29. And usually it's uh, <coughs> males that are uh, the victims of uh, severe burns, serious burns. And most of the burns that uh, we deal with are thermal burns or burns caused by uh, uh, flames. Uh, the uh, critical care transport professionals uh, need to be able to handle the complications that occur from the burn. So there's things that can happen to our patients uh, other than the burn itself. There's sort of secondary injuries that uh, uh, can take place. So as we all know, we all learned way back when skin's the largest organ. Uh, there's a lot of important stuff, keeps bad things out, uh, keeps our temperature going and uh, does other stuff. And so this is what skin uh, uh, would look like uh, if we could uh, see it with the uh, naked eye. It has different levels. Uh, and most people really don't um, respect the skin too much. They look at it and say, yeah, that's my skin. Uh, but there's actually a lot of stuff that goes on there. There's nerve endings, there's blood vessels, <coughs> there's subcutaneous fat, uh, there's muscles underneath it. Uh, we've got our, our hair follicles. And uh, there's a lot to protect us. Um, epidermis. Um, the outer layer there, and it's got a number of uh, different layers to it. And basically, it's the uh, first barrier of our, uh, uh, protects us from the outside world. Uh, our skin, again, sheds uh, all the time. And some, I forget, somebody said that how many pounds of uh, dead skin we have on our mattresses if we wouldn't clean them. And then underneath, you've got the dermis. And you're getting into the nerve fibers, uh, the blood vessels, uh, the lymphatic vessels, uh, oil and sweat glands. Uh, so again, a lot of stuff that uh, is on the skin there, a lot of stuff that helps us to uh, survive in the environment uh, that we're going through. So here's just an interesting looking picture of the dermis, this gentleman here. So the thing that keeps our skin nice, soft, and pliable, we've got uh, collagen and other things in there. Um, and there's proteins in our skin. And that the, uh, these things help us to uh, repair our skin. Skin's pretty good. You get a cut on it, an abrasion, whatnot. Uh, within a fairly short uh, period of time, it's amazing that uh, it, it will heal up. Uh, and these are for minor injuries. Major injuries and burns, it takes a lot longer, and it may not heal up because of this of the damage that, uh, that happens to the skin. So general functions, again, it protects us. It keeps our fluid in. Um, it keeps the, uh, the, the bacteria and viruses <coughs> uh, and other uh, nasty organisms out of our body for the most part. It uh, helps keep us warm. It helps keep us cool. Uh, and the problem with large burns, as it says here, is because it takes a large area of the skin and damages it. Uh, our burn patients are at risk for getting um, hypothermic. And that's one thing we need to, to watch when we're taking care of them. Uh, also helps maintain fluid and electrolyte balance. Uh, important in metabolism uh, within the body. And we're able to sense um, pain. A lot of people say, gee, I wish I didn't feel pain. But just think about it. if you didn't feel any pain, you wouldn't know when you <coughs> stubbed your toe you had a laceration, you broke something. So the skin is really important that uh, um, for managing pain. Our um, patients that are burned over large areas may not be able to feel, feel pain. Uh, also, burns can cause an extreme amount of pain, uh, first and second degree especially. And uh, burn is also has a social component to it. Uh, a lot of times we judge people on how they look. And that's a psychological and emotional thing that patients with major burns have to, uh, to deal with uh, during their life. These are the different causes of burns. Um, and again, with the most uh, common cause that we see are going to be flame-type burns, thermal burns. And there's other ones in there, too, that they're not quite as uh, uh, common. Uh, and then there's a thing called toxic epidermal uh, necrolysis syndrome and Stevens-Johnson syndrome. 
Those are actually diseases that cause bone-like injuries. All burns uh, will cause destruction of the skin and impair the function of our patient. So thermal burns, this just shows how uh, the temperature of the liquid can uh, uh, cause damage and the speed that it can. So you look at 113 degrees uh, compared to 159 degrees. So one second uh, with extremely hot uh, liquid water, whatever's causing the burn. And if you look at the anatomy of a burn, and burns do have an anatomy, there's different zones. So the zone of coagulation, that's where the direct contact is from the, uh, the heat source, whatever it is. The stasis zone, that's injured tissue, and there's stagnant blood flow because the tissue gets ischemic. And so you're getting less blood flow going to the tissue, which can lead to uh, tissue death. And then you have your zone of erythema, and you have an actually increased blood flow because the, the body is trying to bring all the nutrients and stuff there to repair it. And so there's generally minimal damage, and this, that area is likely to uh, recover. So anytime you've got injury to the body, you can have some uh, inflammation taking place, and that's normal. It's the body's way of helping to uh, replace itself. The problem with um, major burns, though, is that uh, it's too much inflammation, and it's going to cause uh, damage to the, our tissues and our organs. And if you get a large enough burn, and here it says 25% of total body surface area burn, is that uh, you get a, a major systemic inflammatory response. So it's not localized anymore, but it uh, can be throughout the body. And so you got uh, substances and uh, uh, liquids that are leaking into the subcutaneous tissue, so you're going to start getting a lot of swelling on these patients. Um, proteins can leak into the lungs. And so they can get pulmonary edema with the fluid there. The immune system gets suppressed. Uh, and again, so things are leaking into the intestines. They can leak in there. And that allows uh, um, bacteria from the intestines to leak into the bloodstream. So now you've got uh, sepsis taking place. And then cardiac output starts going down. So there's a whole systemic thing that's going on with this uh, systemic uh, response there. So when you look at burns, you're looking at the extent and depth of them. You're looking at how big they are, and you're looking at the uh, <coughs> severity. And this is just a chart which shows how they uh, classify uh, bones based on what uh, the tissue damage is, uh, the extent of it, the depth, and things like that. So when you look at talking about superficial first degree, uh, you can think of that kind of like sunburn. Uh, it involves only the epidermis. Uh, so sunburns, or if you go to a tanning booth, uh, if you scald yourself uh, with a minor scald injury, sometimes flash burns. Usually, healing uh, kicks in. Uh, there's no scarring, and most of it usually is within uh, seven days. There's no big problem other than if it's a l you go down to Florida for the first time and you're in a bathing suit and your whole body gets a first degree burn. That's, that's pretty painful and it ruins your vacation. But generally, this people heal up without uh, any problem. Now you're getting uh, into deeper, uh, deeper territory here. Uh, you've got partial thickness, also known as second degree burns. And so you've got the epidermis, and now part of the dermis uh, is involved. Uh, and so you, hot liquids can cause this, or maybe you've got some flame that you had minimal contact with. This is generally going to have blisters. That's one of the defining things for second degree burn. Um, you can have major burns, you can have uh, blisters, you can have minor blisters. Uh, generally, this heals up within 14 to 20 days, 21 days. Uh, generally, you don't need any surgery. Generally, they're not scarring, but there can be scarring. Uh, but these people generally do well, un unless it's a major uh, partial thickness burn. So that was superficial. Now you've got the partial thickness burn, which is a deep partial thickness. So now the damage has gone a lot of deeper. So steam will do this, um, hot oil. Flames uh, can also cause this. It's going down deep into the dermis there. Uh, this can oftentimes be difficult to distinguish from a full thickness or a third degree burn. Um, because this is going so, so deep, you don't necessarily see blisters like you normally would, um, or even charred skin. This takes a lot longer to heal. It can be up to three weeks. You may need s these people may need skin grafts, and they may have uh, a scarring uh, that shows up. Moving farther down, now we're going even deeper for full thickness burn. This is the entire dermis, all the way down to subcutaneous fat. Uh, 
nerve endings get damaged, and so in the third degree burn area, full thickness, they may not have any burn or any pain at all. But a lot of these patients also have second degree burns along with us, so these pati patients are going to be in uh, uh, extreme amount of pain. They're going to need skin grafts, they're going to need surgeries, <coughs> there's significant scarring, there's significant risk of uh, uh, long-term morbidity, and uh, even death. They can go even deeper, and now they're starting to go into the muscles, into the bones itself, they can actually get into the larger blood vessels, get into the, uh, the extremely deep uh, nerves. These are extremely severe injuries, uh, not that second degree and third degree aren't life-threatening, but these are definitely life-threatening. These people don't do well. Again, it depends on the extent of the burn that they've got there. These people, uh, they're going to need surgery. Going to need, it's a long road to hold for these people. It can be months and months and years of uh, rehab and surgeries and hospitalizations. A <coughs> number of different ways of looking at the uh, size of burns. Um, rule of nines is what, uh, pretty standard. Um, used for uh, adult, can also be used for uh, children. Um, but the preferred method is a Lund a Broder chart, but that's uh, more complicated. But we can use uh, the rule nines for children also. Um, and basically, divide the body up into areas that uh, represent, as I said here, 9% of total body uh, surface area. Uh, fairly easy to use compared to the Brun Lauder chart, so it's a, it's a lot less complicated. Uh, Lund Browder charts uh, use more in the uh, uh, in hospital setting there, um, because again, it's it's a lot more complicated, uh, and it's hard to memorize. Where it's easy, fairly easy to memorize the uh, rule of nines. So here's uh, a little little kid, a child, and an adult. Again, dividing up areas into uh, nines, um, and uh, another way of some people do it too, is if you say you take the palm of a patient's hand, that represents 1% of their total body surface area. And so that's another way of possibly doing it, but I think this is just a, a lot easier. One thing to remember, uh, their leg is 18%, but say they're only burned on the uh, back part of the leg, that's 9%. Or say they're burned just on the abdomen, uh, that's not 18%, that's 9%. So you just need to remember that when you're estimating the size of the burn. And this is uh, uh, the uh, Lund uh, Browder chart. Again, a lot, a lot more complicated, uh, a lot more uh, numbers on there that you have to remember. And uh, unless you've got this chart here, use it all the time, you're not going to remember that. So rule of nines is pretty standard, uh, at least pre-hospital. So here we've got major burns, and here it lists some of the uh, criteria for major burns. Um, it has to do with the percentage. Uh, adults versus children, um, and full thickness burns, greater than 10%. Uh, important areas of the body, so face, hands, eyes, uh, things like that. If chemical burns are uh, a major burn, uh, whether alkali or acids, if somebody gets uh, a high voltage uh, electrical injury, inhalation injuries are always uh, a major concern, or major trauma that's uh, involved uh, along with uh, a burn and in any high-risk patients, so patients with major medical problems, uh, things like that that are at high risk. If you have a, a, a new thermal burn patient or any burn patient uh, and they are hypotensive, it's not due to the burn, at least initially, because burn shock doesn't set in for a uh, number of hours uh, after the uh, incident. So you need to look elsewhere for some type of uh, internal trauma. They've got either chest, uh, abdomen, pelvis, femur fractures or something that's causing them to be uh, hypotensive from uh, blood loss. So early on, they're not gonna, uh, our major burn patients are not going to be hypotensive. And then these are other risk uh, patients that are considered major burns that I already had mentioned. Got the moderate burns here, so again, different percentages. There's less of the body surface area is burn. Um, and full thickness burns, 2 to 10%. Um, they don't present a serious threat based on our assessment. Um, to either functional or cosmetic impairment uh, are considered moderate burns. And then mild burns, again, less of the body is burned. And again, uh, less than 2% there that don't appear to represent any serious uh, threat or functional uh, cosmetics to the uh, area are mild burns. 
So here's the skin, what it might look like. On the left, uh, you got the first degree um, burn. You move up to the middle, partial thickness, and then you got f uh, full thickness or third degree. And then the pic on the bottom, you got the actual pictures there. So you got the superficial first degree, partial thickness, uh, second degree, uh, full thickness, third degree, and then subdermal or fourth degree burns on the right. So assessment, it's like any, any patient can do a, a complete initial exam, ABCs, history, physical exam. If you suspect some type of injury, spinal injury, see spinal mobilization. Uh, and again, you're going to get a, you may get a history and exam uh, findings from others, whether it's in the hospital or pre-hospital. But uh, you always need to do your own assessment on the patient because you might pick up something that wasn't picked up. And here's a, just a busy slide. Uh, talking or showing, if you can read this, uh, your patient assessment, the steps you're going through, estimating the size of the burn, the burn depth. Uh, going to need to do fluid resuscitation, maybe yes, maybe no. And there's formulas we'll talk about. Any inhalation injury, is there circumferential burns, because they can create problems for the patient, what areas of the person's burned, um, what co actually caused the burn, are there any other injuries, uh, things like that that you're going through when you're managing right, your burn patients, when you're assessing them. So nothing new here. It's like any of our patients, airway, breathing, circulation on our trauma patients. So we need to be particularly concerned about patients that are in closed areas, <coughs> even on thermal burns, because uh, they tend to have inhalation injuries from the gases. There's particles that are uh, created from the, uh, the uh, burns there. Other things are flowing through the air. Mm -hmm. You may want to consider early intubation, early airway management if you have an uh, inhalation injury before swelling takes place. Uh, the voice is getting hoarse, so they got curvaceous sputum, eyebrows are singed, there's uh, black stuff in the, uh, uh, the airway, as it talks about here. So those of you always want to be ahead of the game. Uh, if you wait too long, the airway might swell up, and then uh, it's going to be hard to manage airway. You might need to go to a needle or surgical crike uh, to get past that. So you want to be proactive on any uh, inhalation burns. And again, these are the things we already talked about. Uh, yeah, circumferential neck burns, because you can get swelling with that, and that gets real hard, and it can impinge on the, uh, the airway of the person. Patients can go into uh, cardiac uh, or uh, pulmonary edema, and not from heart failure, but because of the damage that uh, was done to the lungs from the inhalation injury. Uh, or we give them too much fluid, we can overload them. So you just need to monitor their airway, uh, breath sounds, um, and just very, very particular on that. Uh, anybody with severe lung problems are at uh, risk for having a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And if the lungs are, get damaged enough, they can have a pneumothorax or hemothorax. Carbon monoxide is always a worry, in, uh, especially in closed spaces. Uh, and plus, uh, cyanide is also given off from the plastics and everything that are now in buildings and houses and stuff. Uh, and there are cyanide kits out, uh, out there. So that's one thing to think about in your patients that have uh, collapsed and not doing well in confined spaces, that maybe they have a cyanide exposure along with the carbon monoxide. So patients that are burns may have impaired, impaired circulation, uh, again, depending on what uh, the burn damage is. Uh, but again, uh, hypotension, at least initially early on, uh, are not going to be hypotensive from uh, the burn shock. It's going to be from some other injury there. And uh, again, due to the damage, they can, uh, like it says, have impaired circulation. And so we need to monitor their vital signs, you know, blood pressure, their pulse, uh, circulation to the extremities, because uh, if you don't, it can lead to amputation. And uh, to determine how much fluid they need, there's different formulas out there that we'll talk about in just a little bit. But there's a Galveston formula, the Parkland formula uh, that's used. Most people are familiar with the Parkland formula. And we'll be going over that. So a compartment syndrome can um, happen from a burn also, a circumferential burn in the extremities. And the same thing uh, that we saw with our other compartment syndrome can a uh, patient can be complaining of and the things that we might uh, find. Again, pulselessness is a late find, uh, finding. And again, we want to use the Galveston and the Parkland formula to determine how much fluid that they're going to need. Uh, 
Many times the burn patients awake, uh, and usually they are, uh, and some aren't, uh, but they may also be unconscious, uh, alter mental status, so you need to figure out why that's going on. Is it due to the circulatory problem, respiratory problem, hypoxia, anything like uh, that? One of the earliest things that um, shows up in people that are having problems is they have a change in their mental status, altered mental status. That's a good early warning sign that we need to pay attention to. Uh, depending on uh, the extent of the burn, um, we may need to completely expose them, and that's going to be your clinical judgment. We may need to do a head to toe again, depending on what the mechanism was. Um, if possible, um, before transporting this patient to another hospital, you may want to take the uh, dressings off and inspect the wounds. You may not. Again, it depends on uh, the physician and the, uh, the uh, extent of the burns and things like that. Um, they may be uh, in properly dressed uh, for the, the wounds that they've got. They, one of the big things that you can need to do, and this is from my experience, is you go and pick up a burn patient, um, make sure that they've gotten pain medication, that they've got the right amount of IV fluids going in, uh, that they don't have on large burns, that they don't have wet dressings because they're going to get hypothermic, and that's one of the important things that you can do for this patient is make sure they've got the proper dressings on, that they've been properly medicated, and that they, uh, so they're not hypothermic, uh, and that they've got the right amount of IV fluid going in for the uh, <coughs> extent of their burn. And like any patient, we're going to be getting the history of the patient, what happened, what treatment was given before you got there, uh, your sample, uh, history that you're going to be getting from them. Want to find out, okay, what caused the burn? Uh, were they in a closed, confined space? They're going to want to know that at the receiving hospital. Uh, was it due to chemicals? Again, what caused the burn? And again, any related trauma. So again, that's based on your assessment. You're examining the patient. Was there possibly any trauma that can have an impact on this patient? What was done before they got, uh, got to the patient? Uh, again, pain medications. Uh, did they stop the burning process? What type of dressings did they put on? Did they have to decont decontaminate this person? I think that's important to know uh, that you want to find out, uh, and they should find out if it's in the hospital. When did they get a tetanus? Because they're at risk for developing tetanus. Again, how much fluid they did they get? Did they get the proper amount? And you're going to use your Parkland burn formula, whatever formula that you use. Uh, had they gotten antibiotics? Were they sedated? Um, did they have a Foley in? Did they have a central lines placed? Did they have an escherotomy? Uh, all those type of things. When did the burn happen? And it's real important to bring the records from the transferring facility, if that's how you're picking up your patient. Uh, I've had patients where the transferring facility just sent minimal information, uh, and that's really helpful for you, transferring the patient, and for the hospital that's receiving the patient. So the first thing you do, you need to stop the burning process. If they have jewelry on, uh, on the areas that are burned, you want to get that jewelry off because it can act like a tourniquet. Um, so get them out, uh, away from the source of the burn. You want to uh, Cool them off. It's most effective within the first two minutes. Uh, after that, after 20, 30 minutes, uh, it's not that helpful. And you're going to make them hypothermic. Um, leave the blisters intact, um, except if it's a, a chemical burn, because that's keeping it somewhat sterile. Uh, then you may need to irrigate the burns to cool them off. If it's a chemical burn, you want to get the pH of the wound, or if it's in the eyes, you want to irrigate for at least 20 minutes. Mm. Also helps to irrigate for at least 20 minutes if you've got molten material. Anything like that. Already said, get the clothes and get the jewelry off. And again, keep them warm by placing in clean, dry linen. Again, you don't want to have that uh, wet, wet uh, linen, towels, whatever on there if it's more than like a 10% or so burn. And remember, jewelry made out of metal is going to retain heat. So here they're just they're irrigating this woman or man's arm. Can't tell which one. Uh, to cool the burn. You want to stop the, again, stop the burning process. Airway management is basically, again, do we need to manage airway? Do we need to intubate the patient, whether nasally or orally, uh, because we, they had an inhalation injury and we're concerned uh, about uh, managing airway? And you want to do, again, be proactive on this. It's better if you're in a, in a stable environment, like in the emergency department, the trauma room, to intubate a patient where you've got a lot of room and a lot of uh, resources as opposed to in the back of a helicopter or even in the back of an ambulance. So again, you need to be, need to be proactive. 
because uh, an uh, inhalation injury can swell up fairly rapidly. You may need to sedate these people also uh, to help them. So again, any fires, uh, you can have carbon monoxide, you can have cyanide poisoning, uh, so they can get asphyxiated, so 100% oxygen. Uh, they may need to go to the uh, uh, hyperbaric chamber. So you may want to transfer them to a hospital that does have a hyperbaric chamber. And uh, again, high flow oxygen, uh, and again, monitoring them for um, any uh, uh, adverse results from this. So they can get acidotic, they can get arrhythmias, they can get respiratory arrest, anything like that. Circulation, we want to be early aggressive uh, fluid resuscitation on our major burn patients because they will eventually lose lots of fluid. And so if you don't give them the <coughs> right amount of fluid early on, they're going to be behind the uh, eight ball, and then it's going to be harder to, uh, uh, to catch up uh, with the patient. So that's a really big thing. Uh, and remember, our skin helps keep our fluid in, and so if you've got a large burn, there's going to be lots of fluid that way. And there's going to be uh, mediators from inflammation that take place. It's also going to cause leakage. Uh, from the capillaries into interstitial spaces. So they may not look like it, but internally they're losing lots of fluid. So I already s said about the Parkland formula, the most uh, widely used one. Um, and Parkland formula, you go f f number four times kilograms weight of the patient uh, times percent burned area. And that'll give you either lactated ringers is a common fluid to use or normal saline. That'll give you the total amount of fluids you have to give this patient in 24 hours and then half that's given in the first eight hours. Now, if they've got major trauma that they're bleeding with, uh, you may need to give more fluid. And this is figured out from the time they actually had the burn. So if this person was burned three hours before you got there for the transfer, they're already three hours behind, you're gonna have to adjust your numbers. Uh, the Galveston formula is uh, more suitable for children. It uses body surface area burn plus total body surface area uh, instead of a way to calculate the fluid needs uh, and the reason they use this is that the Parkland formula um, can underestimate the amount of fluid requirements needed in a burned child. Uh, I may not provide even the uh, usual daily maintenance requirements for the child. Uh, one of the reasons for that is there's a huge variability uh, between body surface area and weight in a growing child. It depends on the uh, age. And the formula for that is you take 5,000 mLs per meter square of burned area plus 2,000 me uh, milliliters of total, uh, per total body surface area, and that gives the uh, amount of fluid in the first 24 hours. And just like Parkland, you give half of that in the first eight hours. And you want to monitor urine output. Adults, you want at least 30 mL per hour. On kids, you want one mL per kilogram per hour. If it's an electrical burn, they're going to want more fluid. And that's so you, you would readjust the, uh, your formula. So here they're monitoring the urine output. On your major burns, you want to have a Foley catheter in so you can see how much urine is coming out uh, uh, on your transport in uh, each hour. Because that you may need to adjust your uh, fluid, the amount of fluid you're giving each hour. Or if you start seeing dark urine, now you're starting to get myoglobin and rhabdomyolysis. Um, and the kidneys are starting to uh, shut down there. So the standard stuff you do, you cool them, irrigate it, uh, decontaminate it, and then on your major burns, you want to dry it and uh, dress it in clean, dry dressings. You don't want uh, large, wet dressings on the patient because they're going to be hypothermic. Uh, again, leave blisters intact unless they're chemical, and you want to irrigate that. Um, you want to try and get tar and asphalt off as much as possible. Now, pre-hospital, we're not going to be able to do that, but if it's a hospital, you may, they may be able to do that uh, because those things can cause infections. And there's different products there that they... Uh, they have in hospital that can be used to get, uh, get it out there. They get rid of uh, tires, get rid of asphalts. Uh, normally, we're not going to debride, uh, means removal of dead tissue. Um, they're going to let them uh, do that in the uh, uh, receiving hospital, or they may have started doing it in the uh, sending hospital. So wound management, again, major burns. You want to have uh, dry uh, dressings uh, on. Uh, if you've got the fingers or toes are involved, you want to have two by twos or four by fours, something between the fingers. You don't want the skin uh, touching one another. You want the hands in position of uh, function. So it's going to take, just like peritonitis, if the intestines rupture, the stomach rupture, it's going to take a while for an infection to set in. Um, so early on, we're not going to be giving any antibiotics. 
Uh, again, it's important to find out from uh, the patient when they last had a tetanus. Uh, antibiotics will be given in the hospital if uh, uh, need be uh, to prevent the wounds from getting infected. Uh, usually a tetanus is good for the um, last five years. If they haven't had one in five years, they're going to be uh, getting in one. Uh, if they haven't been immu immunized, they're going to have to go through a series of immunizations uh, to prevent uh, the patient from getting tetanus. And pains are, pain is extreme in some of these patients, so that's one of our big uh, jobs is managing the patient's pain. Um, morphine is a good choice. You do have to watch blood pressure and respiratory status, though. And again, uh, you want to uh, medicate uh, every 10 minutes until they're comfortable, as long as your vital signs and their, uh, their respiratory status is staying uh, okay. So you just need to be very careful on that. And you want to give the medications IV. You don't want to give it IM. I already talked about hypothermia. Uh, besides uh, the dry uh, sheets and blankets, um, you know, if you have warmed IV fluid, that will also help with the patient. Um, but you don't want your patient shivering because they have a lot of uh, wet dressings on. Major burns may have problems uh, developing ileus, meaning the intestines aren't having that nice peristalsis there. And so uh, you may need to put a, an NG or OG tube in, depending on the patient's condition. Uh, it's going to take, uh, uh, some people swallow, swallow a lot of air. It'll help getting that out. Uh, it'll help uh, uh, prevent the vomiting. So again, being, being preactive. And this is just a busy slide showing uh, what to do with so the immediate care, emergency management, things you're looking for. Uh, getting a patient history, and then consulting the burn center, uh, the information that they're going to want. Long term, they can go into renal failure for our major burns, um, rhabdomyolysis, and so the urine might start shutting down, so that's why they need to get this uh, amount of fluid, among other things, to keep the kidneys flowing. Uh, they can get acidotic, um, and so they may need some sodium bicarb. Uh, they may need a diuretic like mannitol because fluid is building up because, again, they're, they're leaking all over the place. And you just have to watch out the amount of fluid that you give because of the, uh, uh, if they have congestive heart failure or something like that. All right, so ocular burns. Again, not life-threatening, but the patients can lose their vision, can be blind. Um, really important, and, and this is usually with chemical-type uh, burns, but it can be flame burns if the patient wasn't able to close their eyes. Um, quick enough, or if the eye, eyelids got burned off, but minimum of uh, 20 hours, or, I'm sorry, 20 minutes of irrigation. Um, they, ha they have a thing called Morgan lenses uh, that uh, they have in the emergency departments. They're like contact lenses with a little tube that comes up and that's hooked up to the IV fluid. In the uh, emergency department, the physician will uh, numb the eye up and then uh, nurse or doc will put the uh, organ lens in and then you run the IV fluid, the lactated ringers through that, and they'll do that until, if it's a chemical burn, until the pH comes up uh, to normal. And they can uh, do it in both eyes. Uh, I don't know if any pre-hospital systems carry it, but it's a pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, nice thing to uh, irrigate eyes because I don't know if you've ever, anybody's ever tried to hold somebody's eyes open while you're, you're pouring liquid in it. Uh, they're going to fight, uh, fight that. So this uh, really helps uh, to get the uh, uh, solution into the eyes. So lingers, uh, lactated ringers is best, uh, but normal saline is acceptable. Facial burns, again, you have to be concerned about the, uh, the eyes and the airway. Uh, edema can develop fairly uh, quickly. Uh, and if you've got facial burns, uh, if there's no spinal injury, elevating the head of the bed, again, helping uh, gravity to help somewhat with keeping uh, the swelling there. But you have to be very careful and very proactive, again, watching for um, a lot of swelling in the uh, face and airway. Ear burns, uh, again, not life-threatening. Again, that'd be something in your assessment that you would check. Um, circumferential burns, uh, the problem with that is if, say, the arms, the legs, the, uh, the thorax has circumferential burns, you can get uh, compartment syndrome. And uh, you can actually um, lose extremities there. And the same thing with the chest is the chest, because burn tissue that's circumferential, any burn tissue turns into like scar tissue for the major burns. And 
that gets very stiff. And the concern with uh, the thorax is if that skin is now scarring and it's really thick, they can't take a good inhalation, they can't inhale, and so they're going to have a respiratory compromise. And so they will need to do uh, escharotomies on the, uh, uh, the thorax and also on the arms and legs if they got circumferential burns because they need to get restore mo mobility to both the chest and the, uh, um, the extremities there. Uh, only done on, again, circumferential burns if they need to save the life and limb of the uh, patient. And the hospital, if it's in a hospital that's not a burn center, uh, they would be consulting with the uh, burn center uh, about that. So you may have a patient that has these escherotomies done uh, when you get there. And hand and foot burns, that's a, a major burn. Uh, again, keep elevated. Again, put two by twos, four by fours between the, uh, the, the digits in there. Um, again, no creams or ointments on any of the burns. That's amazing what some people put on burns. I've had patients put uh, butter on their burns and whatnot. So we, we don't want to do any of that there. Genital burns. Uh, Again, not life-threatening. Uh, they should have a Foley catheter if possible. Uh, you need to look uh, and examine it because it's, uh, it's part of the, the body and uh, uh, assess that. And pediatric burns and child abuse. One thing I was on to have in the back of your mind on pediatric burns is, is this possibly child abuse? And I'm not saying that all children that are burned have, have been abused, but that uh, is one of the common things that you can see in child abuse. Even though children are little, they've got a very large surface area compared to uh, adults. Any sick child, you always want to get a blood sugar on, even if they're not diabetic. Kids, unlike adults, don't have uh, these good glycogen stores that we can draw on uh, as our body is going under stress and using glucose. And a major burn is very stressful, and so the metabolism is going to be higher. Uh, kids and adults are going to be using up their glucose. Adults, we can draw from these uh, glycogen stores. It's like a bank. Children don't have that. Like adults, do, it's a lot less. So you want to make sure that you get a, a finger stick on uh, any sick kid to see if, uh, what their, their glucose is. Uh, so they may need to get some uh, D50, uh, depending on the uh, age, the weight, or D25. Uh, one statistic says that 25% of all childhood burns are the result of child abuse. So again, that's something that would be part of your uh, uh, assessment there. And if you suspect it, it uh, needs to be reported uh, to the nurse or physician in the emergency uh, department. Uh, most accidental burns with kids are found on the face and the chest. If they're found elsewhere, then it may be uh, a sign of abuse. Um, and again, it may not. Uh, but again, you want to have your, your radar up there, radar uh, going in case it is uh, suspected child abuse. And then you want to make sure that you document really, really well. And you want to do that with all your patients, but especially in the child abuse, because that's a legal record that may be used in uh, uh, court proceedings. Electrical burns may not look bad at all. Uh, there may be a, an opening on the palm and an, uh, an exit wound on the foot. And so it doesn't look too bad, but Anything between the, the opening wound in the hand, going down the arm, going all the way through the body and coming out the foot can damage uh, uh, tissues, organs, blood vessels, uh, nerves. Uh, alternating current is found in uh, homes and businesses. That's the most common thing that's going to zap somebody. Uh, direct current is found in uh, some automobile systems and uh, lighting systems. Uh, also lightning uh, is that. And as the electricity goes through the body, it's going to release this massive amount of heat uh, through the body uh, or across the body, again, damaging tissues, organs, uh, blood vessels, and uh, nerves. And again, you're not going to see it, uh, at least initially. Uh, the risk for these people is having cardiac arrest, uh, respiratory arrest, and then uh, progressing to uh, renal failure. Uh, lightning, a class of thing that you may see, and so somebody standing outside and the tree or the ground gets hit by lightning, they get hit by lightning. If you look on their skin, it looks like, if you've ever seen a fern, it looks like a pattern of, that a fern would have on their, uh, their leaves there. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see. The thing with the uh, electrical burns is they need more fluid than a, uh, a typical thermal burn um, because, again, a uh, big chance of affecting their, their kidneys. So they're going to need actually more fluid than a, a regular, just uh, strictly thermal burn. 
and they you know, actually want a higher urine output, uh, maybe even up to 200 mLs uh, an hour, as opposed to 30 mLs an hour on a, a thermal burn. Chemicals are all over the place in homes, industry, uh, on farms, um, and kids can get into this. Uh, people sometimes keep them in refrigerators, uh, uh, liquid chemicals and things like that, uh, and so it's pretty dangerous for kids. Uh, you need to make sure you get the person uh, uh, completely uh, all the clothes off, irrigate with, uh, and this is liquid chemicals, uh, large amounts of water. If it's uh, powdered chemicals, you want to brush that off because a lot of chemical, powder chemicals, if water hits it, there's an exothermic reaction, and it actually uh, generates heat. Uh, yeah, we never use uh, chemicals to neutralize burns, and we have to remember that chemicals can get absorbed uh, into the skin, and they will continue to burn as they're going down through the uh, uh, skin tissue. Uh, acid burns generally will form a scar, and they don't go as deep as alkali burns. Alkali burns will keep burning uh, as it goes into the tissue and do uh, greater damage deep down. Finally, we have this, uh, what look like burns, but it's due not to actual burns themselves. There's a toxic ep epidermal necrolysis syndrome. And this is due to hypersensitivity reaction to certain medications. Uh, sulfonamides, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, and anticonvulsants like Dilantin are uh, most common uh, that you're going to see for these people if they do have it. But there's uh, environmental allergies that can cause it and unknown toxins. Uh, what happens is that there's a sudden onset of these skin eruptions uh, that kick in. Before this happens, though, the patient will be complaining of, you know, feeling tired like they got malaise. Um, they're anorexic. Uh, they don't have an appetite. They might be running a fever. Uh, they can get some inflammation of their eyelids, conjunctiva, mouth, uh, and their genitals. You're going to start seeing uh, some erythema, a redness on the skin with tenderness. And that's usually in the axilla and groin. Um, and then it will eventually extend over the entire body surface. Uh, and then you start getting the skin eruptions. Uh, blisters and the bulla will form. And then what can happen is the entire epidermis in the body will be shed. Um, kind of like a snake, you know, a snake sheds your skin. Uh, and what you've got is you see this um, open, weeping, painful areas uh, of the underlying skin. So it's almost like they're kind of filleted, uh, extremely painful. Uh, they can have pulmonary complications from it also. Uh, they need intensive burn management uh, and hopefully in a burn unit. So these pe people are in pretty bad shape. And then you've got uh, Stevens-Johnson uh, uh, syndrome. Uh, and it's thought that this is an autoimmune disorder. And before the, uh, the, these bolus lesions show up, these people also have this pro prodromal thing. They start running a fever. They got a headache. Again, they're tired. They got malaise. They can have a sore throat and they can throw it and have a cough. And then what will happen is they'll get multiple um, red bolus lesions on the, both the skin and mucous membranes. And They'll form er erosions on the skin and crusts when they rupture. And it can affect the mouth, the air passages, the esophagus, the urethra, and the con conjunctiva. Uh, if they have corneal abrasions or ulcerations, uh, they can have blindness. This uh, can also affect the kidneys, and it can go all the way from the respiratory tract uh, passages down into the lungs. Uh, this can be mild. Uh, as opposed to moderate or, or major, but usually the mild forms of this disease are usually self-limiting and um, require uh, no treatment. So this is here, they're doing an escharotomy. Um, they're getting their equipment ready. They're going to uh, sedate this person uh, and give pain medication, <coughs> use good aseptic technique. And they want to uh, make the incisions in a uh, well-defined uh, uh, pattern. And the incision needs to be uh, deep enough so that there's obvious release of pressure on the skin. And what you'll actually see is the fat will also bulge through the incision. That's what you want to see, because that's releasing the pressure. Um, on the chest, the incision is going to be made along both anterior axillary lines. It can also be performed transversely across the chest, again, depending on uh, severity of the, uh, uh, the burn and the scar tissue there. Uh, the extremities, it's going to be uh, made parallel to the bone along the extremities. 
Uh, if it's the hands involving the, uh, the fingers, they'll make uh, incisions on the medial and lateral aspect of each finger and in the palm of the fingers. Uh, and that's, again, for uh, circumferential burns, because, again, it's not allowing the thorax for chest expansion. And if the extremities, it's putting pressure, and swelling is going to be taking place, and you can lose the extremities uh, in hands. And on the chest, they're going to run into uh, respiratory, ventilatory compromise. Thank <laughs> you.